The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. After Jesus had revealed himself to his disciples and eaten breakfast with them, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Amen, amen. I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. As we continue our novena to St. Peregrine, let's say our novena prayer together. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the wonder worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious St. Peregrine, aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. In chapter 19 of his Gospel, St. Luke tells us about the beginning of Jesus last week on earth, and it forms something of a journey. Jesus was on his way up to Jerusalem. On this last stage of his journey, he had intensified his catechesis of his disciples telling them that he would be delivered into the hands of sinners, that he would be scourged and killed. Unfortunately, St. Luke tells us, they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. So they were in the dark. They couldn't see. So St. Luke follows this with a story of the healing of the blind man in Jericho, a story which is also found in Mark although both Mark and Luke treat it differently in terms of detail. In Mark, Jesus meets the blind man on his way out of Jericho. In Luke, he meets him on the way into Jericho. Now what's common to both is the witness of this man who is suffering from handicap. So the infirm man is a witness to the whole. The sick man proves to be more acute and more in touch than all of the supposedly whole people around him. The man who doesn't appear to have much value in their sight turns out to be the one who tries to open their eyes. So in Mark's version of the story, Jesus is passing through Jericho on the final stage of his journey to Jerusalem. And there he encounters a blind man who sits begging at the city gate. So the man is beside the way. So everybody who goes in and out must pass by him. But of course he's a regular fixture. So most people do not see him, they see through him. So he has to shout, asking for pity. Now most people pass this beggar by without giving him a second thought. And the irony is, of course, that he can see things that they can't. When he hears the commotion of the crowd, he asks, who is it who is passing by? And the crowd tell him, it is Jesus of Nazareth. But the blind man doesn't call him that. He shouts out, son of David, have mercy on me. They see Jesus of Nazareth. The blind man sees the son of David. 
So the irony is, of course, that this crowd can't see the true identity of Jesus, the chosen one of God, the anointed one. It's the blind man who sees. Now the cry of the poor blind man stops Jesus in his tracks. It's an abrupt stop. When you see tourists at the top of an escalator in the subway, stopping at the top to open their maps to work out where they are, you see a whole pile up of people behind them. Well, that's what we're supposed to imagine. Jesus stops and a whole crowd of disciples cannon into each other. And in the midst of all this tumult then, Jesus hears the cry of the poor beggar in the midst of all the noise and tumult round about. This is the cry that he hears. As we read in the Psalms, the Lord hears the cry of the poor. Jesus heard this man's cry. And he ordered the disciples to call him, and they did. And then he asks a very significant question. What do you want me to do for you? It's the same question he asked James and John a few verses earlier when they're seeking places of honor at his right hand and his left in the kingdom. They want glory. All the blind man wants is to see. They ask for something for themselves. Well, Jesus asked the blind man who sits by the roadside, scorned and pitied by all who pass by, what do you want me to do for you? So there's another echo of the Old Testament here from the lamentations of the prophet Jeremiah. Songs of desolation at the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction and the exile of the people. The prophet sings, Come all you who pass by the way, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. But no one saw the sorrow of this blind man except Jesus. They're in a state of blindness. But they haven't raised their voice to God to send them a deliverer like Jesus. Only one among them calls out to the son of David to have mercy on him. Look and see my sorrow. But the blind man has no doubt that Jesus can heal him. He wants to be whole again. He wants to share in full humanity, to be free to go where he wants, when he wants, how he wants. And in answer to his faith, Jesus says, go your way, your faith has saved you. Now Mark puts in another interesting detail for us. Jesus says, go your way. The blind man has not been able to go wherever he wished to go before. He couldn't go his own way. He had to follow other people's way. He had to be led by other people, or other people pushed him around. Now all of a sudden he can choose which way to follow. And how does he exercise that choice? What direction does he choose? Mark tells us he immediately he received his sight. He followed Jesus on the way. But the first thing he saw was the face of Christ. He looked on the face of the incarnate word. And that vision so enraptured him that he followed Jesus on the way. The way of Jesus became his way. The way is not just any old road, it's the gospel path that leads to Jerusalem, passion and death. Now life isn't happy ever after in worldly terms for this man because he doesn't go back to his family, he doesn't try to make up for all those years of blindness or all those times of not seeing. He followed Jesus on the way. He became a disciple. And so Mark also gives us another detail. He gives us his name. Very few people are named in Mark's Gospel. He's called Bartimaeus. And he sprang up from the ground to follow Jesus. So it was a quick and sudden and agile movement. But he left his cloak behind. The cloak was not there just to keep him warm. It was spread out around him to catch the coins that passers-by would toss in his direction. The cloak represented his livelihood. It was an instrument of survival. And when he left it behind, he was symbolically leaving everything behind to follow Jesus on the way. Now the last potential disciple in Mark's Gospel was the rich young man who wanted to know how to be saved. And Jesus told him, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the young man went away sorrowful. He couldn't leave it all behind. So once more in the Gospel, the peripheral, the marginal figure shows the way of discipleship. Whereas James and John couldn't see the point, this bland man saw it at once and received his sight. He learned to see from looking on the face of Christ. Now if you follow Jesus in the hope of personal gain, security, authority or power, then you're doomed to disillusion. But if you ask to be able to see so that you may follow him on the road, this he can grant you. If you look for personal gain or are motivated by personal interest, then you will never find it. If you ask for mercy, you will receive it. 
The essence of the law of the gospel is you shall love God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The law of sin and death is you shall love yourself. Now St. Luke, in his version of the story, tells us that after curing the blind man, Jesus encountered another, a man called Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector for the locality and therefore a very wealthy man. Because tax collectors, as you know, were entitled to a commission on all the revenues they raised. So Zacchaeus had got to the top of his profession, achieved all that he could reasonably expect to achieve. And yet there was something missing in his life. He was not happy. And it's this fundamental unhappiness, the sense that all is not right with life, that Jesus seems to uncover in people. He awakens a kind of nostalgia for God deep within them, And often these people were the marginalized or rejected ones, the ones at the edge of society, the ones who were shut out by other people, like the blind man hidden behind the throng of Jesus' apparently enthusiastic followers. So it's precisely to those who lived in the twilight zone that Jesus brought his light. So Zacchaeus was seeking to see Jesus, but he was small. And he was so determined to see Jesus that he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed a tree. The tree was a kind of sycamore tree, not like the ones we may have seen or are used to, but it was more like an oak tree with branches that came down close to the ground and with a lot of leaves. So in other words, this small man picked an easy tree to climb and his foliage, which was dense, would conceal him. He wanted to see Jesus, but he didn't want to be seen or for other people to see him up the tree. Those rich tax collectors who need to ensure people fear them don't get into vulnerable positions like this where they can appear ridiculous. Neither do you want him to see Jesus. He was hiding from him in the trees. He was also hiding because he knew that he was an outcast and he feared the judgment of Jesus that it would be the same as those around him. Now, when we're afraid of being judged by others, a natural reaction is to hide. Children, when they have done something wrong, will often spontaneously cover their faces. They try to hide because they believe that if they can't see you, you can't see them. They become invisible. So Zacchaeus tries to hide from judgment. But of course, in fact, he's fleeing from mercy. He hid because he didn't want to take the risk of discipleship and to expose himself to the threat of conversion. Well, the irony is that Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus, but in fact, it was Jesus who was seeking him. There's no place you can hide from God, and it's our need that exposes that. At the end of the Gospel, St. Luke has Jesus say, The Son of Man has come to seek and save what is lost. It is God who seeks us, but our response often is to hide from him. But Zacchaeus cannot hide. Jesus looked up and called him by name. He orders him, come down quickly, make haste. So Zacchaeus has to make an exodus. He accomplishes his own Passover, his own exodus, in haste, as when the people of Israel were ordered to eat the Passover standing up and to make haste. So St. Luke emphasizes the immediacy of the obedience, and he came down quickly at once. He receives the same invitation as the disciples, come, follow or Lazarus when he is called back to life. Lazarus, come out. The same invitation as those who are heavily burdened by a sense of failure and exclusion. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. So Zacchaeus is a representative figure. He represents us, every man and every woman. And in his story, we see something of our own story since the Garden of Eden. In many ways, we have been wanderers fleeing from God since the gates of the garden were first shut behind us. It's God's constant joy to come in search of us. So Zacchaeus' own disordered life is a kind of commentary on Adam's fate. Adam, too, you will remember, was afraid of the judgment of God. And after eating of the fruit of the tree, he and Eve hid themselves in the trees because they were afraid. God searched for them too and called out to them, where are you? Just as he calls out to us as we try to hide behind the trees in our own lives. Where are you? Adam heard the voice of God and he was afraid. Zacchaeus heard the voice of God 
and was filled with joy. So two hidden men, two men who were lacking in courage, two sinners in the trees who were trying to hide themselves, but God found both of them. Zacchaeus was invited to eat with the Lord and was full of joy. Adam's fear was transformed into joy by the forgiveness that ultimately Jesus would offer. Humanity, itinerant, wandering and lost, was found by the God who came to seek and save the lost. But this transformation is costly for Jesus. Jesus entered Jericho, the last step, the last halt, before arriving in Jerusalem where the cross awaits him. And the road from Jericho to Jerusalem begins with a tree and it ends with a tree. Salvation comes to the house of Zacchaeus, but it costs. And with the liberation of Zacchaeus from hiding, Jesus begins his own via crucis, his own way of the cross. At the beginning of this way, we find a man who is excluded, a sinner, fearful, high in a tree. And at the end of this road in Jerusalem, we find another tree, the tree of the cross, the tree that Jesus will climb. The tree of Zacchaeus was a sign, a symbol of his life, his alienated life of exclusion. Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham, but also a son of Adam. He was the heir of the disobedience of Adam. But the voice of forgiveness gave Zacchaeus the confidence to come down from his tree and enter into the communion of the mercy of God. Zacchaeus no longer needed his tree. Jesus must take his place. Zacchaeus climbs down from his tree, but this liberation is possible because Jesus will mount his own tree, the tree of the cross. But on this tree of the cross, nothing will be hidden. God in human flesh will hang naked for all to see. This, the second Adam, will take on Adam's shame and heal the wound whose consequences we still suffer, but which can no longer rule our lives. So let us say our prayer to St. Jude Thaddeus. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jew, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us, and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. Amen.